We're back talking tax with Tom, Tom Yamachika of the Hawaii Tax Foundation. <clears throat> Today, we're going to talk about the, the physician shortage. Uh, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii. And, and Scott uh, Grosskreutz, did I get that right? You uh, did. Joins Thank us. And, yeah, and I'm, I'm making a wild assumption. He's a doctor. <laughs> He, he's actually a radiologist, and he joins us from Hilo, Hawaii today. So he's going to uh, help talk about our physician crisis and what we can do about it. Okay, well, we have a physician crisis. And I wanted to say to start that, uh, <clears throat> you know, a, a healthy patient uh, depends on a healthy doctor, and a healthy doctor depends on a healthy tax system. How do you like that? That's my my words of wisdom for the day. So let's jump in, Tom. Let me ask you, do we have a, a healthy uh, tax environment for doctors? Well, we don't, and let's uh, put up a graph that shows why. Uh, the University of Hawaii uh, had uh, compiled some statistics about supply and demand uh, for physicians in our fair state. And uh, as you can see, the demand keeps going up and up and up and up and up. And the supply uh, either is uh, stagnant or uh, goes in fits and starts and then you know starts trending downward. And leading to a uh, an ever widening gap between physician supply and physician demand and you know what that means right it means that when you want a doctor you can't get one now the trend is disturbing because to the extent there is a trend it means that this is going to get worse we know it's been getting worse for a long time and you know, i can remember who back in the uh, 80s and 90s, uh, when at one point there were no OBGYNs in Kauai, uh, none, zero. And, uh, you know, they, they said the reason was uh, malpractice cases, but I'm sure it was more than that. And now it's that and much more. So, Scott, what's your, uh, what's your input on this? You observe it, you see it happening. Uh, why is this happening? What are the current vectors? Well, Jay, I've been practicing in Hawaii now for, for 35 years. And, and as you say, it's, it's been a long-term uh, crisis that's, uh, or shortage. And it's, it, now it actually is becoming you know, a healthcare crisis. So we've got shortages of physicians as, as high as, as 1,000 physicians. We also uh, don't have nearly enough APRNs and PAs. Um, and to make things more challenging, uh, we have about a quarter of the physicians in the state of Hawaii are past retirement age at age 65. Here on the Big Island, a third of us, myself included, are past retirement age. And so we're kind of re, you know, relying on a lot of uh, older physicians uh, to, to, keep, um, to keep the population cared for because we're having a great deal of difficulty uh, recruiting and retaining uh, new physicians out of training. And, and that's just a, it's a huge concern. Um, it's a concern to the point where uh, the president of the Healthcare Association of Hawaii said that we're having trouble staffing hospitals over the last several weeks and asked for an emergency proclamation. Governor Ige uh, granted a, a waiver for, out of, for in state taxation or re licensing requirements for nurses, saying it was an immediate peril to public health. Our congressional delegation, especially uh, Representative Case and Senator Schatz, have pointed out how access to care on the outer islands is, is really critical. Now, now, the good news is that in Hawaii, we've had some of the best, we have actually the best healthcare outcomes in, you know, in the nation in recent years, which is wonderful. And that's due to the prepaid healthcare act, which Hawaii was a pioneer of in making, making sure people had insurance. And the others, we just have a very good uh, group of, of local providers, docs, nurses, APRNs that are, that are caring for people. And once we, we lose those individuals, I, I think we're, we're really going to be in trouble. Uh, where Hawaii is kind of falling back, I think, is, is we're ranked number 31 right now in healthcare access, meaning when you need a physician or a healthcare provider, you can see that person. Um, and what's going to happen, especially on the outer islands, uh, where there's far fewer providers than there are on Oahu, is that we're, we're, we're among the worst in the country you know, for, for access to health care. There was a recent study of the 3,000 counties uh, in the United States. And of those 3,000 counties, uh, the Big Island had the third worst shortage, Maui had the fifth worst shortage, and Kauai had the 13th worst shortage of primary care physicians in America. So that just kind of shows you that, relatively speaking, uh, we've got a real problem on our hands. Uh, well, just take a moment and, and delve into the individual doctor situation. 
Okay, what, what makes um, a doctor not want to practice? What makes a doctor want to leave for greener pastures elsewhere um, and, um, you know, be part of the drain? Well, it, it probably, Jay, depends on where that provider is in the course of their career. So usually these days, by the time you finish up with college and medical school and internship and residency and often a fellowship, you're in your early 30s. Uh, your debt indebtedness for, for educational loans is often, you know, a, a quarter million dollars or more. Often it's, it's as high as half a million dollars. And so if you're going to be moving to Hawaii because you've been trained on the mainland um, and you're coming here, you basically are looking at, can you afford to buy a house or pay your medical school bills? And, and it, you, you know, it's, it's kind of almost like an either or, and you certainly don't have enough money uh, left over usually to start a private practice, which can, you know, cost, as you can imagine, hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the facility and, you know, get it, uh, hire your staff and everything like that. So for, for younger providers, it's really important that we train as many people as we can locally, uh, because local people are much more likely to stay in practice in the long term in Hawaii, uh, and that we enable them to remain financially viable during the early years in the practice when they have these heavy debt burdens to pay off. Uh, for for physicians who are in the mid-career or, you know, uh, getting older, um, the, the real challenge is just staying financially viable uh, in the state of Hawaii. So there's only two states in the U.S. that tax patients for, for their health care needs. So one is New Mexico and the other is Hawaii. And that often has a huge impact on patients and their families, say, you develop renal failure and require dialysis, or perhaps your child develops leukemia, uh, and you're looking at you know hundreds of thousands of dollars of of, of healthcare costs. If you apply, you know, uh, 4.7, you know, get with a county surcharge on top of that, you know, you could be looking at tens of thousands of dollars in state taxes, you know, for for being ill, or you know, having a member of your family ill. And obviously, if you've got a, a significant medical problem, you're usually unable to work and and to pay those debts. You know, so, you know, that that's a problem. Um, Hawaii is the only American state that taxes Medicare, Medicaid and TRICARE. And for for Medicare, as you know, well, what's TRICARE? What's TRICARE? TRICARE is, is the insurance company for uh, folks in the military mm -hmm. and their, their dependents. OK, sorry. Um, but so we have about 20 percent of our population, Jay, is uh, on Medicare and about 30 percent is is in Medicaid. Um, so for Medicaid, you know, we all earn that benefit by paying, you know, federal Medicaid payroll taxes or Medicare payroll taxes. Uh, so really what, what Hawaii taxes Medicare benefits, what you're doing is it's a state tax on a federal tax. Um, and one thing that that's a, a problem is the only state to tax Medicare, Medicaid and, Med and uh, Medicare is that usually those those taxes cannot be passed on. You know, if, if you've got to get tax on a, on a loaf of bread, you know, the, the, the bakery is going to pass that on to the consumer. Um, but Medicare policies prohibit uh, healthcare providers from passing these state taxes on to the healthcare. And we usually don't uh, pass the get on to Medicaid patients because they can't afford it. So basically what's happening is healthcare providers are paying their patients get tax for, for half of our panels, half of our patient population. And in the mainland, you know, a lot of times it's folks are, you know, they they have a challenge, you know, trying to take care of Medicaid and Medicare patients. Cause usually with Medicare, you kind of break even with Medicaid, you usually lose money. And so in here, why, if, if you take care of uh, Medicare and Medicaid patients um, and then you're, breaking even or losing money, you're still paying the GE tax on your gross income. Uh, so you're, you're losing money caring for patients. And when you're in a position where you're losing money caring for half the patients, you know, that you, that in your, in your panel, that makes it very hard for clinics to stay viable. Mm -hmm. There's uh, the largest um, urgent care and primary care clinic on the North shore of Kauai, uh, Alilea Medical Clinic. That's, that's on the verge of going bankrupt according to their CEO. Uh, they're losing forty to fifty thousand dollars a month, and they're only keeping their head above water because of uh, generous donors in the community. Right now, we have uh, outpatient surgery, community surgery clinic in Hilo. That's uh, that also has is, is been on the front page of the paper because they may have to close. Uh, we're seeing a lot of um, of physicians 
unfortunately close their practices and leave. Uh, there was one recent access to healthcare survey performed by the Hawaii Rural Health Association. When they queried providers, they said that uh, up to half the physicians in the state um, were, were thinking about you know, quitting practice, leaving the state or retiring. So it's, it's obviously a serious enough problem that uh, it's, it's time that we look at it, I think, with, uh, with open eyes and try to find some solutions for it. One other thing I want to cover with you is, is the, uh, the notion of consolidation. You know, there was a, a time when there were a lot of solo doctors um, working, you know, themselves out of their own offices. And that was the classic, you know, uh, the classic arrangement. Um, and um, that's not so much the case anymore because doctors have gravitated into hospitals and larger structures. Uh, why? And uh, does that help or hurt? Well, let me let me kind of jump in here. There's one uh, feature about the GET uh, that hospitals have been taken advantage of, and that is uh, if you're organized as a tax exempt association, and 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 all of the hospitals in this state are, <clears throat> then you get an exemption from the GET on the on the gross amount of uh, uh, fees you get for for healthcare. Um, now, and the same exemption would, at least in theory, apply to any. A hospital or medical clinic, as long as it's nonprofit. Uh, so, uh, would it be possible to, uh, you know, use that feature to take advantage of, uh, uh, or, or take advantage of that feature to to help uh, our physician practices stay afloat? I think those are those are excellent points. Uh, so, Jay, as you pointed out, um, it used to be that most physicians, you know, put their shingle up on their office and they, they had their private practices. And that practice model is becoming less common. For the first time last year, the American Medical Association stated that 40, only 49% of, of providers were in private practice. Um, and hospitals, HMSA, Kaiser, you know, any, anything that's organizations got a nonprofit status, uh, like Tom points out, doesn't have to pay the get. And it was interesting that uh, the president of the Healthcare Association of Hawaii recently said that if the GET were applied to Hawaii's hospitals, to the healthcare provided in those settings, that many hospitals would have to limit their, their services or possibly even close down. So in effect, the GET would, would be, could be a death sentence for our hospitals if we put it on that sector of our healthcare community. Right. So, like there was, there's actually one example recently. There was this uh, a hospital that opened up um, in, in EVA. Uh, on on our island here on Oahu, uh, they they were not a um, uh, a nonprofit, and uh, and they kind of spiral down into bankruptcy. Mm. Yeah, so you can you can see that if if that that that's a case in point that if if the hospitals were hit with the and the physicians that and nurses and everyone else that they employ if they were hit with the GET tax, they probably could not remain in business. The, the GET tax on, on the private sector is probably the equivalent of about a 13 to 15 percent you know, tax because it's on your gross income um, and, and makes no, no allowance for the fact that often you're providing charity care or you're breaking even, you know, taking care of, of folks on Medicare and Medicaid and things like that. Um, so, yeah, that's a real problem now as especially on the neighbor islands where the healthcare shortages are the worst. I mean, it was determined that uh, a year ago about that the Big Island had 53% shortage of physicians and Maui, I believe it was 43% uh, shortage. Um, and, and then you have a situation where you have people leaving private practice. Uh, you know, sometimes the hospitals will hire these folks, but sometimes uh, individuals are just turning, they're doing teleradiology for the mainland or they're, you know, they're leaving the state to practice elsewhere because they can't make their practices work. And, and the real irony is that as the number of people in private practice continues to decrease, at some point, there will be no healthcare providers left to tax with the GET. You know, so the GET tax, if it has the intended effect, you know, which, it, which almost seems like, you know, to, to, to not have people in private practice, once those individuals leave, there will be no revenue for the state of Hawaii. Mm. Uh, you know, from from taxing healthcare and that matter. right right after this show, I'm going to send my primary some roses. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tom, you know uh, what can we do about this? From a, I know there are many many vectors and factors that Scott's talking about historically and and currently, but 
What can we do about this, for example, in the next session of the legislature uh, to make it uh, kinder and gentler for the medical profession in Hawaii? Well, the, uh, the, you know, the candidates who have been running for higher office have, you know, made noises about um, uh, enacting some kind of exemption for food and or health care. Um, I, I think they're going to kind of get a sticker shock when they find out how much this actually costs, uh, because, you know, the, the GET does make a whole lot of money uh, at a, uh, you know, relatively low nominal rate. I mean, 4% is not what you see in sales tax states on the mainland, you know, in in, in Nevada, California, like it's it's 8 9%. Uh, we're at 4%. Uh, uh, but uh, the, our tax brings in a hell of a lot more uh, more money than the sales tax states do, uh, even with an, an eight or nine percent rate. You know, if you if you uh, if you look at that, and and that's and the reason is because uh, the, it's so broad and it reaches so many things, and and it even reaches you know things in uh, in overhead, like any any business may have to pay overhead, like uh, you know. Uh, Power, uh, water, um, uh, basic necessity supplies. Uh, the GET is all there to to grab some of that. You know, what, whatever you pay uh, as an end user, you you need to pay four percent on. Whatever you pay as a um, as a reseller, uh, with you know with few exceptions, uh, the the GET takes a piece of that too. Uh, one of the one of the exceptions is for uh, RX drugs, uh, prescription drugs, and prosthetic devices. But uh, that uh, that doesn't help you if if all you need is aspirin. Hmm. Is uh, uh, Joe Biden's um, Inflation Reduction Act and, and the and the drug provision going to help? Well, I'm sure it'll help on on the on the base prices, but uh, it it doesn't help the tax. Hmm. I mean, because the state tax, then that's a federal program. You know, we've said this before, you know, in a state which is primarily blue, you know, and democratic in both ways, capital D, small d. Um, you know, it's just remarkable that we have a gross excise tax that is so regressive and that hurts the little people so much, including medicine. So, you know, one thing, I, one reaction I get uh, from your comments, Scott, is that the medical profession in Hawaii, for the benefit of it, and for the benefit of all of us, needs to have a champion. That you're in crisis, and you've been in crisis, and it's getting worse because um, you know these these factors uh, you know exacerbate. And so, query: Who is the champion? Or if there isn't one, how can there be one? Somebody ought to be out there really doing a job. Uh, for example, it comes to mind the health department. But um, you know, let's be candid. You need a you need a champion to go and lobby and make some noise about this. Uh, yeah, right, Jay. Uh, we, we do have an organization, the Hawaii Physician Shortage uh, Crisis Task Force, kind of a long name, but it, it kind of lays it out there. We also have APRN and, uh, and nurse members. And uh, so, we're, you know, we're a group of about 50 folks, most who have been in practice for many years, trying to, to raise awareness of these issues. Uh, we, we, it's, it's not like that, that, um, that I think that many of our lawmakers aren't familiar with these problems, but there, but there's certainly. If the more you learn about this, the more it seems that there's a, a real need to uh, to make some changes. We did um, get a uh, a bill submitted in the 2020 session. It was uh, SB 2542, which basically uh, provided an exemption from the get tax for services from from doctors and APRNs, and that passed the uh, the Senate without a single no vote. But when COVID hit, uh, they, they didn't elect to hear it in the House that year, and it was not reintroduced last year. Uh, so it's, I, I think intellectually, people understand that, that something needs to be done. It just has to be enough of priority. And, and perhaps the, you know, the general public needs to you know, kind of also talk to, uh, to folks during this election cycle about, about their concerns. And you know, this is a, a much bigger problem than just uh, than just you know how this affects providers that's actually the small part of it uh you know as as you know, your audience will, will recognize hawaii's been losing population now for over half a decade last year we lost over ten thousand people 
Uh, and that is in large part due to the cost of you know, you know, many things, of food, of, of health care, of housing. Uh, you know, when it comes to, to food, uh, like Tom pointed out, I mean, it gets a pyramid tax. If you, you raise coffee and you, you, know, you sell your beans to a coffee wholesaler, uh, they pay the get, then they sell it to somebody to roast and package the uh, the beans, and they pay the get, and then you sell it to uh, to Safeway, and Safeway pays the get, and Safeway sells it to you, and then and then you pay the get on that. So, <laughs> uh, but really, if if we don't if we don't fix this problem, we're going to just see uh, we're going to have a worse access to health care, and you can take a look at the Department of Health statistics. The mortality, morbidity rates for all kinds of different conditions are higher than, than uh, on the neighbor islands in the Arunawaku. So the, so the death rate from heart attack and from trauma and from suicide and from, from diabetes and from asthma, from hepatitis C, you go up and down the list, you know, there are substantially higher death rates from, from these many disease processes if you live on Kauai or Maui or the Big Island compared to Oahu. So, uh, you know, it's important that we fix that. And, and the other thing that I think that sometimes isn't really realized, and, and, and Mayor Roth made this comment uh, in a meeting with us uh, a number of months ago, if you, if you don't have a viable healthcare system, it gets to be very difficult to, to basically try to, uh, recruit new industries you know or businesses in your area to provide good jobs for people and, and i think that's really true there was a uh, an ama uh, study on the national economic output of, of physicians and a single physician in a community basically results in increased economic uh, aggregate output of over uh three million dollars and so if we were able to recruit a thousand positions, we would, we would have about another $3 billion of aggregate economic activity. We have $17,000 in new jobs and the increased state and local taxes could be as high as $127 million. You know, just from having the necessary healthcare providers that we need to provide you know, care in the community. So, you know, I, I don't think it's a null sum game. I, I think that if we had a vibrant healthcare system and adequate access to care, it would benefit the state and overall be economically more healthy. Yeah, well, the ghost of Christmas future is not is not very encouraging because uh, you know it has implications all over the community and it's a spiral down. I mean, look, if I can't get access and I get sick and I become a burden, uh, then it costs other th- it, got, it costs the state in other ways take care of me if I'm bankrupt and what have you. Um, and if if um, new new entrants in business don't come here because they don't want to enter a market and they don't want their families entering a market that won't provide adequate health care. You know, you have a, a whole spiral effect. It's, it's not just me, you know, and the medical community. It's the state and the medical community. Uh, so, uh, you know, it, well, it's the it occurs- state and the community in general. Uh, that's right. That's right. Because if you, you know, if, if people are sick, they're not productive. Um, you got, you got to have them well to be productive. And, uh, and, and you have to have people who, you know, know about these diseases and and can take care of these folks. You know, but I want to point out that it's not just the gross excise tax. It, it's much, much more than that, uh, even from Scott's comments. I mean, for example, suppose I, I went down to Kaka'ako and doubled or tripled the size of the medical school right now today. Um, suppose I supported the tuition there. Um, suppose I incentivized, the, you know, the training of new doctors. Suppose I gave them special incentives to go to the neighbor islands and practice there for a period of years after they graduate, so forth. Um, suppose I incentivize hospitals. Um, you know, it's a matter of money. If the state puts some money into this, we could alleviate the problem, I think. Well, it's uh, not only money. It's uh, it's regulation, right? I mean, uh, we, we have a, um, uh, a, a system requiring certificates of uh, what is a CPC and uh, uh, certificate of need. public uh, certificate of need? Yes. Yeah, certificate of need. So you need to go through regulation. I mean, doctors, uh, healthcare is regulated, and and if the regulators don't allow you to, you know, put up a clinic or expand a, an existing clinic, you can't do it. So that that's another problem, you know, independent of tax. You know, one thing you alluded to, Scott, is um, you know this thing about reciprocality. So suppose I'm a doctor and oh, I'll pick a state. I'll try to pick a blue state. I'll pick uh, California, okay? And uh, gee, I want to have a little sunshine. So uh, I'm I'm interested in coming out if it's a, a decent pathway for me. Um, but reciprocality is not so easy, is it? 
can I just come out from California and practice in Hawaii? Is there anything we can do to draw uh, doctors and healthcare providers from other other states? Uh, there, there could be. Uh, as during the COVID pandemic, um, state licensure requirements were uh, were waived for doctors, nurses, and other providers just in order to get enough people to help take care of us here in Hawaii. Uh, the challenge is that the physician shortage um, is projected to be as high as 130,000 by about uh, 2030 nationwide. And there's also projections of, uh, of, of nurse shortages as high as, as perhaps even a million. Um, and there's been some studies recently that were published that talked about the entire healthcare community in the US and, and people are, are pretty toasty after COVID. COVID was a huge uh, stress around the system. I mean, we, we lost uh, some healthcare providers who died. We have others that have had, you know, long haul COVID symptoms and others that are just kind of exhausted from, from the, the situation. Um, so try, you're basically trying to attract uh, more providers from, from, from a country where there's not very many healthcare providers to, uh, to attract from. So there, there are some things that you could do. There's a surprising number of, uh, of physicians that graduate from medical schools in the US every year, and there's no residency slots for them. It was, it was a math problem. Somehow the federal government decided to allow more people to be trained in medical school than we have slots for them to complete their education. So we, we have thousands of, uh, of, of licensed physicians that aren't able to complete their training. So Hawaii could step up do res more residency training programs. You know, the, the recent bill signed by the governor to increase the number of training slots for medical students and residents, uh, I believe nurses as well. I mean, that's a step in the right direction, but when, when you finish up with your training, um, unless there's some system where your practice is gonna be economically viable, you'll probably practice for a few years, perhaps pay off your, your obligation. And then again, we, we could be losing people to the mainland. Um, the some of the big picture aspects about practicing in Hawaii is that um, CMS treats Hawaii like a, a low cost industrial state, like we're CMS. Like we're Iowa. CMS. Yeah, CMS. Exactly. What is and CMS? So, uh, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Mm -hmm. So that's the government agency that decides what you're going to, you know, individuals are going to get paid. And Alaska is kind of like Hawaii, where Alaska has got a very uh, it's got a population that's very isolated by geography, you know, a lot of remote Indian villages and people on, on islands and things like that. Uh, and so the Alaska congressional delegation said, listen, we're, we're so short of providers for our Medicare patients that we have to do something about that. So they, they got a bill passed where basically they increased their, uh, their payments per, per, per what they call RVU or relative value unit by, by 50%. So in Alaska, they're making about 1.5 times what you would if you were a healthcare provider, an APN or doctor in Hawaii. Um, and so that, that's, that's a real problem. We've, we've got you know, this very low reimbursement rate. Uh, the local payers tend to uh, pay very close to Medicare rates. So there's no cushion like there is in the mainland where often uh, private insurance companies pay substantially more. Uh, then you've got very significant pre-authorization requirements where, in effect, every time the physician wants to prescribe a treatment or a diagnostic test or uh, a course of therapy, they're, they're kind of second-guessed by a, often usually a vendor in some other state who's often not even a physician. Uh, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if our local health care providers are perhaps wasting up to 20 you know, 15 to 20 percent of their time just trying to fight, you know, to get uh, pre-authorizations done. And that's that's going to it's kind of demoralizing for a lot of uh, healthcare providers too. You go through all these years of training, you, you know your patient the best, you know current therapy, you know the national guidelines, and yet every time you make a, a decision about healthcare, you're being second guessed, and often there's delays in that. Yeah, well, it's easy to get inequitable. Uh, you know, look what's happening on the mainland about abortion. It becomes inequitable so quickly when you let the government inside those decisions. One other thing I wanted to ask you about was uh, uh, some uh, some reference that I made earlier to. Uh, what ha what happens when um, uh, there's um, too much tort litigation? Ergo, uh, the expense of uh, malpractice becomes uh, un unaffordable for doctors and so forth. And and in this state, we haven't had tort reform, as has existed in other states in a long time. Uh, what effect does that have? Uh, what what effect would it have if we did have tort reform? 
Um, I think it could be beneficial. Texas uh, had a problem where they, they had a severe shortage of healthcare providers and they enacted uh, uh, tort reform and they substantially impro improved the number of, of people that were practicing in their, their community. So it, it had a big beneficial effect there. Um, so it's probably that, that that would be part of a, of a global fix, Jay. You know, to, to put tort reform in there with with uh, reasonable fame, you know, payments and fair taxation. You know, if if the state really needs to increase revenue, what you want to do, I think, is is you, you know, you have a progressive tax on those at higher income brackets. You don't prevent businesses from making a profit in the first place. Um, and really, kind of as a result of these various factors we're talking about. Uh, out of all 50 states, Hawaii is dead last in the availability of providers to accept Medicare patients. And that we're behind all of their 49 states in the District of Columbia. Um, and at a time, again, where half of our population is on Medicare and Medicaid, you can kind of see that that's, that's, that problem is going to get worse shortly. Tom, it looks like we really have to do some, uh, some reorganization. Uh, nationally, I think we should do some reorganization. We've been having shows with uh, Canadians, you know, about the Canadian healthcare system, and it strikes me as more equitable. It strikes me as more efficient, and uh, and there's access, there's access to everybody, uh, which is really a wonderful thing. We we haven't learned that yet. We're still fighting that battle. Um, but query, you know, um, you know, uh, what what kind of reform could we do here in Hawaii? How much of that is tax, and you know. Uh, uh, tax credits um, to the industry. Um, what what can we hear on this discussion, this show? You know, talking tax with Tom. What can we recommend? Well, I, I think uh, uh, we need to kind of step off the gas pedal when it comes to taxing healthcare. I mean, th th there should be, I think, a re realization. I think you know there is a realization uh, that the problem is real, that the relief is necessary. Um, that the physicians really are, be, you know, caught between a rock and a hard place. The rock being the uh, 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 the uh, low reimbursement rate, and the hard place being the GET that's put on top of it, uh, and and the uh, uh, prohibition against you know g passing it on to the consumer. So um, yeah, something's got to give, and. Uh, you know, I think if we, you know, if we want as a policy matter to have docs in our state, uh, we, we need to do something about this. Yeah, well, I put it to government. Um, you know, uh, granted that the trade, so the trade association you're talking about, Scott, um, you know, is, is helpful, um, but it is uh, self-interested, at least in the minds of the legislators. Um, and we need, uh, we need champions here. We need the Department of Health which is a huge juggernaut organization. It has a huge number of people who are presumably able to do this. Uh, we need the governor, and he, he will be in likelihood a doctor, uh, as you may recall, and uh, hopefully he'll step forward understanding the problem and taking steps. But I, I think uh, we, we need an all-hands-on-deck approach, and that includes champions at every level of government. Your final comments, Scott? Um. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about these issues. They're complex, and uh, you know, hopefully, this will help uh, educate folks in Hawaii, particularly the general public, you know, about these issues. Uh, and again, this is a problem that's just not affecting healthcare providers; it's affecting our, the health of our communities, our family members. Uh, it, it, it's having a negative impact, I think, on on, on the state. And and the one thing I would uh, kind of close with here is that. Uh, the Hawaii Department of Taxation at their website on Tax Facts 98.1, it basically states that yes, uh, if you're on, on Medicare, Medicaid, or Tricare, you will be, uh, you know, assess the get tax, and your provider can can will will basically can elect to pass that on to you. And just just a warning for anybody that's starting practice in the state of Hawaii or moving here, you cannot do that. You cannot follow that guidance because if you do, you'll be investigated by the the uh, Office of the Inspector General for, for Medicare fraud. So I, I, I think that's something that we should uh, think about. We, we, we should not be promoting uh, actions, I think, that, that could get folks in hot water because if, if one is uh, investigated for Medicare fraud, that would probably be a career ending event. And, and the last thing we can really afford is to lose any more providers. Yeah, true fact. Tom, your last thoughts? No, I, uh, I, th I think we really do have a problem. We need to do something about it. You know, if we want, if we want to keep our docs, and we want to keep our docs, 
Yeah. Better do something about it. Our health depends on it. How about this? Our lives depend on it. Okay, you guys, we got to go now. I, I, and I, me especially, I have to make make the call to my florist. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, Scott. Scott Grosskreutz and Tom Yamachika, talking tax with Tom. Aloha, you guys. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.